It's obvious the security lights would set off an alarm. I needed to find somewhere to hide, or the guards would kill me. According to Mr. Sultan, this was the switch that would open the laser door to Mr. Logan's cell block.
Mr. Silton seemed to think this would open the cell block door. Luckily, he was right. Unsurprisingly, Mr. Logan's cell was locked, but, thanks to my speedy brain, I was able to hack it in seconds. Mr. Logan was not pleased to see me. No one ever was. But I couldn't work out why. However, when I mentioned Mr. Silton, he soon cheered up. We quickly made our way outside. Although I wasn't sure about Mr. Logan's stealth techniques, they were quite different from mine. But, someone must have noticed Mr. Logan was missing. As, with a bright flash, we were soon attacked. This still wasn't the plan, said Mr. Silton as he insisted he was okay, and that, no, I didn't need to clean up the trail of blood. He did however urge me to take care of the huge tank bearing down on us. into the van. Mr. Logan and Mr. Preston took out large guns as Mr. Silton gave me some driving software. It basically explained that one foot pump made the van go, and the other one signaled Mr. Logan and Preston to fire their guns.
hope that all the bullets fired led to non-fatal wounds, but statistically that was incredibly unlikely. Strangely, I felt too excited and relieved to care. Mr. Silton winced as he clutched his bleeding shoulder and explained how you can't make an omelette without breaking a few eggs. I think broken eggs meant dead people. Sometimes, he said, you have to do whatever it takes to survive, even if that means killing. But not innocent people, said Mr. Logan as he stared straight ahead. Eventually, I asked Mr. Logan what he had done to end up in prison, but he just continued staring out of the window. Mr. Preston smiled as he said, I suppose someone should explain. He told me when the war started, he and Mr. Silton had avoided conscription, but Mr. Logan was called up. His unit's first orders were to sweep through a huge urban area, killing anything that moved. The only trouble was, hundreds of refugees had recently taken shelter there. The generals knew that those people were there, said Mr. Preston, but they couldn't have cared less. This isn't the time for another one of your conspiracy theories, interrupted Mr. Silton, although this obviously annoyed Mr. Preston, he continued explaining how Mr. Logan and another man deserted, and, after a poor attempt to hide in a wooden vaulting horse, the pair of them were caught at gunpoint on a train, whilst trying to speak rudimentary German. Mr. Logan guided us down a small side street as Mr. Preston complained that he needed the toilet. Mr. Silton asked why we were taking the scenic route while he was trying not to bleed to death. But Mr. Logan gave Mr. Silton a quick glance. You're fine, he said with the faintest of smiles. Soon the night sky was full of twinkling stars and I was able to impress everyone with my navigation skills. The software was state of the art, but I remember Heather telling me how the ancients had used the stars in much the same way. It always made me smile, thinking about the names she gave the constellations. It was the middle of the night by the time we got back, but Mrs. Silton was still up waiting for us. Really, again, in the same place, was all she said as she shook her head and tended to Mr. Silton's second bullet wound. Mr. Preston nearly knocked us over as he sprinted towards the bathroom. It appeared that his body had kept on making urine, even though it didn't have anywhere left to store it. I asked Mr. Silton about Heather and the old lady, but he said he was just about to wash his hair. When I asked him again later, he said the main thing was that we'd got Logan and the van back, and couldn't the rest wait until I had cleaned up the band room for him. I didn't know what to say. Everything we had done, everything I had helped him with, I thought it was all to get everyone back together. But now I didn't know what to think. Before I could say anything, Mrs. Silton explained that it was okay if I only traveled on trains and was alone. I must have looked worried as Mrs. Silton smiled and continued, If you really want these idiots to go with you, they can disguise themselves and catch the next train after you. Mr. Silton was dismissive, and said I'd get nowhere without proper ID. They'll be stopping robots for even the tiniest of things, he said. And a robot passport costs a fortune these days. Well, said Mrs. Silton, it's a good job I've got this. Mr. Silton looked confused and asked where Mrs. Silton got the money. Sometimes, said Mrs. Silton, when God slams a door in your face and shoots you twice in the shoulder, he opens a window. Mrs. Silton explained how Preston had given her the extra money. He said there was good money to be made selling pills and powder to people that distracted them from the world being an absolute mess. Bedtime, said Mr. Logan as he carried his guitar into his room. Everyone else left one by one, leaving me stroking the dog.
I awoke to the sound of Mrs. Silton making herself some breakfast. It felt very early, but I suppose it was just that we had gotten so late. Mrs. Silton gulped down her coffee, and with a reassuring smile she said, Let's do this. The pedestrian tunnel was far longer than I expected, but it was nice, it gave me a chance to chat with Mrs. Silton. She told me she was from an upper class family, and that her parents had nearly disowned her when she married Mr. Silton. But she said she really was happy being with her husband. And after all, as she put it, he did provide for her in this messed up world. However, I couldn't help but laugh when she said how much she liked Mr. Silton's band. I steered the conversation onto the topic of the war. She explained she had been a nurse near some major combat, but she looked really sad, so I changed the subject. I asked her if the town was nice. Mrs. Silton smiled, and described it as a wretched hive of scum and villainy. Train tickets cost 1000 So Mrs. Silton said I should trade in some of the things I'd cleaned so I could afford to travel. However, when we tried the door, it was apparent that the junkyard owner wouldn't be back for a while. So Mrs. Silton suggested I try to earn some money by other means. She said there were plenty of jobs in the town that a robot could do. The largest of the old ladies explained the job to me. I would be drying plates. She explained that old people couldn't afford to retire anymore. So she and her friends had to take menial jobs. All of the old ladies would be throwing plates at me as quickly as they could. I just had to catch and dry them.
look at the old doormat into some kind of drinking establishment. But the bartender soon made it clear that, as he put it, they didn't serve my kind here, and that I would have to wait outside.
point. 